For Prima Media's Polity, I'm Motabi Hwayani. Constitutional Court Judge Justice Edwin Cameron discusses his memoir, Justice, a Personal Account. The book is appropriately titled Justice, a Personal Account because you have used your own life experiences to explain how rights and constitutionalism can improve the lives of all South Africans. Can you talk a little about how you do that in the book? I set about to write a book about the Constitution, but I wanted to make it accessible. I wanted to make it accessible to non-lawyers. I know lawyers are also reading it and I'm very pleased that they are, but it really was a book for the general public. I didn't want it to be abstract, I didn't want it to be hard to read. And then I thought the best way of doing that would be to make the law accessible through my experience of it. Not to tell the story of my life and not to foreground issues in my life, but to use things, literally use instrumentally issues from my life. So that's what I do. Uh, I use the fact that I'm white and therefore benefited from apartheid. I use the fact that I was poor grew up uh, poor and lived in a children's home with an experience of a parent who was in jail uh, and fought against poverty but experienced poverty. And I use the fact that I'm an, a proudly gay man to, to uh, explain the question of difference and diversity and why we must value it. I use the fact that I've experienced stigma from AIDS and that I'm living with HIV and that I'm healthy because of antiretrovirals to explain how the Constitution helped us to get uh, our wonderful uh, publicly provided treatment program. So each chapter starts with an intensely personal connection to the law. But really, the theme of the book and the objective of the, of the book is to capacitate South Africans, to say to them, we've got lots of reason for doom and gloom. We've got lots of reason to be angry and pessimistic, but we've also got a constitution and it's a terrific instrument and it's there for us to use and how we use it depends on us. The book discusses some of the most fascinating and groundbreaking cases in South Africa's legal history both under apartheid and under the new democratic constitution. Is this a book mainly for lawyers or do you see it as having a wider appeal? It definitely is for non-lawyers too. I'm very pleased to know that many lawyers are reading it. Many people in the legal profession, my colleagues, uh, judges and advocates and attorneys are reading it. My ideal audience for the book is really first year law students. And the reason I say that is that uh, I want our law students to know what we've come from, why we struggle to have this beautiful constitution, what it means, what opportunities it offers for us. I fear that youngsters now, the youngsters born after 1990, after 1994, who are entering law school next year, the ones entering law school next year will have been born in 1995 or 1996. They don't know where our legal system and this wonderful constitution with its extraordinary values and its very effective practical mechanisms and instruments, they don't know where that comes from. So I'm really hoping that law, that law schools will prescribe it for their first year law students, but also for the general reader because the law is at the core of our South African transition. The thing that distinguishes us as South Africans is our constitution. It's the world's most generous hearted, progressive, visionary, uh, ample constitution. That's what gives us our moral standing as a country, is the constitution. So I want to reach all general readers as well. A section of the book discusses the jurisprudence relating to HIV and AIDS, in particular the treatment action campaign case and how TAC's victory changed the lives of those living with HIV and AIDS in South Africa. Today we have more than two million South Africans living on ARVs. Has war against HIV and AIDS been won and what must still be done? Well let me start with the first part of your question first because it's a really interesting one. I think the most momentous decision that the Constitutional Court, where we're sitting here on a beautiful, crisp, wintry morning in, in June, uh, the Constitutional Court's most momentous decision was the one about access to antiretrovirals. And it came in the middle of our nightmare of presidential denialism under Pre President Mbeki. And yet, the Constitution was vindicated because a group called the Treatment Action Campaign assembled a host of, of allies, civil society allies, they took to the streets, they exercised all their rights under the Constitution, free speech, 
uh, freedom of conscience, freedom of movement, freedom of organization, freedom of assembly. But most importantly, they demanded the right to health care, which under our constitution is justiciable, which means that the courts can look at whether what government is doing to provide access to health care is in fact reasonable. And the courts judged President Mbeki's AIDS program at that time, it was at the start of the AIDS program, they said it's not reasonable. And to President Mbeki's credit, he bowed his head before the courts. And history will credit him for that. I know history will judge him harshly on other issues, but on the credit side, and a very big positive credit, is that he followed that judgment. Slowly, slow-footedly at first, but the reason, as your question says, we've got this massive antiretroviral treatment program in the, in the public service because of a court decision. Now the second part of your question I think is even more important and that is that the AIDS epidemic is not over. Mm. It's not over. I've been living with HIV now for 29 years and we're doing so much that is right but we're not doing enough of it. Mm. So we need more prevention, less stigma, less discrimination, less judgment, more openness, more talking, more treatment, more testing. We need more of all of those things. And while we have 2.6 million people on treatment, and I'm so proud of that, I'm proud of the fact that we are a functioning country that, that really can save so many millions of lives with drugs every day. When our own government said it couldn't be done, Minister Manta Chabalamala Alam Samang said this can't be done, we're in Africa. Mm. She was an Afro-pessimist on that, we've shown the Afro-pessimists amongst ourselves that they are wrong. But still, you know how many people are dying of AIDS every year? Still nearly 200,000. It's a terrible figure. It's 10 times the figure that are dying on the roads. But we don't see it. And why don't we see it? Because people aren't talking about it. Invisible deaths, TB, pneumonia, you know, diabetes, this is what we say. And why don't we say it? Because of stigma. So we've still got the epidemic. The epidemic's gonna be with us for another generation. AIDS is not over. I've been living on antiretrovirals now for 17 years. I'm healthy, I'm vigorous, I'm ultra fit. I work long hours, I travel widely for my work. And it's because my life was saved by antiretrovirals and that's the positive message. So, We've got to do more. We've got to bring the death rate down. And the most worrying statistic is the one that I haven't given you yet. It's a statistic taken from the Human Science, Res Sciences Research Council's household survey of 2012. They estimate that the new infections in that year, 2012, were 450,000. These are all young people like yourself. You know, young people in their late teens, early 20s, early 30s, and that to me is the most tragic figure. I want to get to each one of them and say, love yourself, love your partner, love carefully, love safely, love with a view to a future. Even though HIV is now manageable, don't get it. You don't want to have HIV. It's not worth getting it. It's traumatic, there's stigma still. It means treatment for the rest of your life. Don't get it. And that message we still have to get out. President Becky's legacy will forever be tainted by his denialist dogma, but you tell a story about Minister Maduna informing you that President Mbeki mandated government to abide by the TAC judgment and uphold the rule of law. Things could have gone horribly wrong and turned out very differently if government did not enforce the judgment. Do you think history has judged President Mbeki too harshly? I think the judgment of history on AIDS will be harsh. And the reason it will be harsh on President Mbeki is that President Festus Mukhaya on the 1st of May 2001 said, I'm going to treat every Motswana who needs antiretrovirals. That is when we should have made the same commitment, instead of which we made it three and a half years later. So you can actually measure those wasted years of skepticism, of questioning, of uncertainty, of ambivalence, of dark, dark uh, rumour mongering, terrible years. And that will be negative, but President Mbeki was a man with an arresting and challenging intellect and a commitment to Africa. His mistake came from his commitment to Africa. 
And that commitment to Africa is what led him to realize that he had to bow his head before the constitutional court decision, even though his Minister of Health didn't want him to do that. And the contrast is a vital one for us to understand as South Africans, and especially for our young people to understand. The contrast is on our borders. Look at Swaziland. We've got an autocrat there, a monarchical autocrat, Kim, Kim, King Mswati, who flouts the orders of his courts. And to our north, we've got Zimbabwe, where President Mugabe's government also disregards and disrespects the orders of its own courts. And the result in both countries has been deeply, deeply hurtful and harmful to human welfare, to economic progress, to predictability, to good order. And we don't have that here. So that was a, a pivotal contribution, I think, to constitutionalism and the rule of law that President Mbeki made. You suggest that our feelings of superiority make us miss out on the sumptuous feast of otherness, differentness and diversity. How do you think that we can all try to transcend prejudice? Prejudice comes from fear. And difference is difficult. Uh, sexual difference is difficult. I'm a gay man. I'm a proudly gay man. I'm a white man and I'm proud of being white too. Not because white is better than black, but because it's the way I am. And being gay is the way I am, and being gay is the way that 5% of Botswana speakers, Botswana speakers, 5% of Venda speakers, Kosa speakers, Jewish people, Muslims, everywhere. It's a natural variant of humanity. But it challenges people and it makes them fearful because it deals with sex. So it is difficult, but we have no choice. There, there, there are two reasons. Let me start, go back one step. There are two reasons why our Constitution values diversity. It mentions it in the preamble. It says we are united in our diversity. And that shows that we gather strength from the fact that we are different, from the fact that we've got a Muslim community or a traditional, uh, cu traditional cultures. It, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a veritable a landscape of riches in our country. The Constitution recognizes that. It, in the Equality Clause, in the Languages Clause, Official Languages, it recognizes that we are different and that our differentness is beautiful and enriching. And by not discriminating against people on the ground of their differences, their irrelevant differences, we strengthen ourselves, we strengthen our society, our communities, our homes. But there's another reason, and that was the reason I mentioned a moment ago, we've got no choice. Our continent has been deeply disfigured by intolerance of diversity. It's led to mass murders to millions of people. In Rwanda, as we became a democracy 20 years ago, in Rwanda there was the most horrific genocide. 10,000 people per day killed for 90 days. Almost 900,000 people. It is almost unimaginable, but one must imagine it, because where did that come from? intolerance of diversity, from fear, from suspicion. So we have no choice in South Africa. We must embrace the richness, the power, the beauty, the loveliness, and the strength of diversity, because to do anything else would be disastrous. Poverty, inequality, and corruption appear to be the main challenges that South Africa faces. How can South Africans use the Constitution to confront these challenges? And do you think there is one particular area we should prioritize, like education or corruption? I think corruption is a terrible problem. This court gave a decision three years ago saying that government is under a constitutional duty to set up a sufficiently independent anti-corruption unit. And the question whether it has done so is still being litigated. We've got a case now pending shortly in this court about that. I think education is desperately important. And I know that from my own life, because my big break in my life came from having access to an excellent high school. And I wish that every South African in every rural area, in every township, in every suburb could have the public, public the government school education that I had. And I know they're not getting it. And that to me is one of the bleakest and worst features of our transition, that our education system uh, is, is not delivering the results it should be. I think though that the major problem, the major feature I think is the, the equality clause. Mm -hmm. I think that the most unexplored clause 
in our constitution is the equality clause. Uh, the, the problems we have are many, that not just education, not just corruption, violent crime, crime against women, crime against babies, terrible crimes. So we've got many, many problems. But if you ask me about the constitution and constitutional litigation, the area where I think uh, our public interest lawyers have been least uh, enterprising and maybe least imaginative has been about the equality clause. Mm -hmm. And we'll wait to see what they're going to do there. As judges, we can only wait and decide the cases when they come to us. Do you see more books in your future? I get the option to retire in a few years' time, and I must retire a few years after I get the option. And one of the things I'd like to do is to write more. I would very much like to write more. I enjoyed writing this book. It's a book which I've, I'm told by many, many people is enjoyable to read, is interesting to read, and is, is accessible to read. And I'd like to do more of that. That was Edwin Cameron on his HIV AIDS activism and advocacy within South Africa's constitutional framework.